Yeah. Okay, well, it says it's recording. Cool. Wow, people, lots of people. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Raven. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am the president of the Northwest Screenwriters Guild. Um, you can see all the events that we do on nwsg.org. Uh, I am just going to let you know, um, for this event, uh, we do have you all muted right now. There's going to be a Q&A section at the end um, in which um, you're free to ask questions. You can also um, put things in the chat um, during the presentation if you if you have questions. Um, we will be answering those uh, toward the end. If at the end you do have questions and you want to um, to uh, ask that yourself, just go ahead and raise your hand. Or if you have your your video off, you can use the little raise hand feature, and we can call on you, and I'll unmute you so you can ask your question. And um, with that, um, I will let Mike take it away. Uh, do, you, do you want me to start, or should should we hang out for a couple? Um, that is up to you. I think we have. Let's see how many people we've got here. Uh, how, how many How many people are from uh, outside of Seattle? Raise your hand. We have folks from outside Seattle? Yeah, we got a few. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So We've got, uh, let's see, it looks like 18 people. So there's still a few more that could be joining us. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick story before we get started. Uh, the way I came to, to study and theme is I, I took a year off to study screenwriting many years ago, and I, I knew I had to learn how to write characters and understand plot and understand formatting and understand this, that, and the other thing. And I knew there was this thing called theme out there, but it's like, I got to learn this other stuff first, but then I never circled back <laughs> to, to learn. And it's, it's a, a really important part of storytelling. And so then I started getting grayer and grayer and grayer. And then I thought, you know, it's probably time I should, should maybe, I kind of got these other things sort of, I sort of understand them. And so then I went back and took a deeper, deeper dive. So a lot of this stuff, well, almost all of this stuff is not uh, uh, Mike original creation. It's bits and pieces I've taken from all kinds of different places and all kinds of different pieces. And I apologize if I don't reference where uh, the person who came up with this theme or this concept or teaches this or was in this book, it's just all a mishmash in my head and in writings and notes. So it's just kind of a, uh, it's not me. We've been doing this for a very long time, uh, meaning storytellers. So, uh, with that, yeah, as, as Tiffany mentioned in, in the um, chat, uh, Mike does have a blog um, that he will often write topics uh, about screenwriting. Theme is one of those, and I'll just go ahead and put it in the chat so that everybody knows. Yeah, I have uh, I've been doing that, that for a while, and if you've read them, you'll recognize uh, uh, a lot of the subjects in there uh, because every, it's like a, a one or two minute read. They're always quick reads no one has time. But uh, with that, uh, do, you want, do you want me to get started? I'm all ready. You guys all ready? All right. So one, thank you for being on time. You're my favorites. Don't tell the other people. Uh, this is about a 30 minute uh, presentation that I'm going to do. Uh, and then uh, we're going to review a script or two. And then uh, take some questions and the, uh, the presentation will be available as a download uh, uh, afterwards. So you can take notes, don't take notes, uh, whatever you want. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and share that one. And everyone should be seeing theme, why it means everything to your story. And uh, let's get started. So theme, what is theme? It's the DNA of your story. It's the controlling idea. It's the central argument. Uh, it's called a lot of different things. I think uh, Robert McKee calls it the, the controlling idea. Uh, it's in every part of your story. I never start without having at least the topic, if not the theme that I'm writing about before I start. 
however you write is the valid way to write because it works for you. Me personally, I design everything. So I know my theme, I know the topic I'm, uh, I'm writing about. It's because I'm lazy. If you write 100 pages and then figure out what your story is about, you have to go back and rewrite so much. And I, 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 I'm just not, <laughs> I'm just too lazy. I don't want to do it that way. I design it first. And I think after, uh, in the next uh, few minutes, you're going to see why. So why do we incorporate themes? What are the advantages of using them? It's, it makes your ending so much better because you're building to an emotional peak. It's also easier to produce so people, uh, your, your script in theory would become more saleable. And I'll expand on all of these subjects in just a few minutes. So selecting the right theme, you wanna pick a universal theme. We're talking about the human experience, and so you wanna talk about big universal things that, that people relate to, vengeance, coming of age, father issues, mother issues. One, this for, one it's connecting with the human experience, but two, it makes it more uh, you know, marketable overseas because father issues are father issues are father issues for all of time in every culture. Uh, so pick love, vengeance, uh, a universal theme. Again, it makes it more marketable. And you know, that's what we do. We're trying to get people to relate to the human experience that we're trying to uh, channel through our scripts. Now the maximum number of themes, you put a bunch of themes <laughs> into uh, a screenplay. I put six into once, it was a train wreck. Uh, this is what I, what I say. If you're new to theme, pick one theme. You can have two or three, sure. But when you're teaching someone to juggle, you throw them one ball and say, master that. Then you give them two balls and they master that. And then three, three balls. You never hand a first time juggler three balls and say, start juggling. Just pick one, get good at it, then move on to, you know, like I said, you can have a couple, three themes going on easily. You don't want a whole bunch or I'll show you an example of that later. So why is theme important? It tells you how to design your cast. Okay, every character is going to react to the theme in a different way. Your characters either live within the code of the theme or outside of the code of the theme. They believe in the theme or they don't believe in the theme, but they all have a view of what the theme is. And so uh, if you're drawing a, a cast uh, that, that deals with the theme authority, you draw it something like this. Thinking back to the usual suspects, all these characters deal with authority in a different way. It also theme tells you how to design the world. There's a wonderful movie, uh, Yesterday, When the World Forgets About the Beatles. And Jack Malik remembers the Beatles. And so he takes all the Beatles songs and tells everyone that those are his own. He is lying to the world. So everyone in the world tells him the truth including a swarmy agent <laughs> who tells him uh, things like, uh, uh, yeah, you come to LA, you're gonna record uh, some records, you'll make a lot of money and we'll take most of it. Everyone in this movie is constantly telling the truth. He is lying. And only when he tells the truth does he find true happiness. Theme also tells you the structure. You're, th you gotta take this away from you can take away anything. Your, your protagonist is constantly bumping up against the theme. So uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you how, how plot is, how, how theme you know, basically uh, creates your plot. You, you can structure a plot based on theme. And it sets up the most emotional moment of your story. So if you know how to uh, properly set up a cathartic moment, uh, if, and if you built theme into your first act and into your second act, uh, it's going to make that third act just so much stronger because people will feel it. No one logically says this is the theme of the movie while they're watching it, but they feel it deeply inside. The more times you can expose them to the theme, the stronger the theme becomes. So why is theme important? It tells you basically everything you need to tell the story. And without it, if you don't have an identifiable theme, people are going to make one, their own. Directors, actors, production designers. 
the production team needs a plan. And if they don't have the strategy, they can't make a plan. And so that's how movies go off course. They have a bunch of different themes going on. They have, uh, you know, the production designer might be making this movie and the director might be making this movie and it becomes confused and crowded with different themes that are going on. They aren't all the main theme that's resonating. So having a theme makes it more attractive to anyone who's producing or directing because they can see that's what we're talking about in every aspect of the movie. So, how to come up with a, with a great theme? Well, it, it's, it's something more than just a topic. You should have something to say about the theme. Why it's personal to the writer? Why are you passionate about this? Why do you wanna live in this theme for months? It takes months to write this to write a screenplay. So if you have experience in it, you have to really sort of think how you're going to make this story different with your particular theme. For example, in The Reverend, it's a story about revenge. But the unique, that's, that's the topic. But the theme to this story of The Reverend is how far would a man go to avenge the death of his son? Once you, you, you cue into your specific theme for your specific movie, it becomes a lot more rich than revenge. And if you, you remember the Reverend, there are tons of scenes that, that cue into the idea of, you know, the, uh, how far would you go to avenge the, the death of your son? The main character is constantly being challenged by the theme in this movie. In the neo-Western No Country for Old Men, rugged self-determinism, that whole concept, you know, of your typical Westerns turned on its head. Fatalism is replaced with randomness. And Ed Tom Bell, the protagonist, he's a man out of time. He's overmatched by the world of today because he's the guy from the, the rugged self-determinist concept. And now this world is random. You can see that in uh, Anton Chigurh, the antagonist. He flips a coin. That's how he determines whether people live or die. There's a randomness to it. And that's clear in the book by McCarthy and in the Coen Brothers movie. Now we get to the good stuff. Your characters need stuff. Your theme is the connective tissue between the internal and external need of your protagonist. Let me explain. So Idiot Jones wants to find uh, the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark. We know by the end of the movie, he's got to go find that. That's the external goal of Indiana Jones. If your protagonist doesn't have an external goal, you got a serious problem, you got to go fix that right away. But he also has an internal need. Something's missing or broken in the protagonist's life that needs to be repaired by the end of the movie to make them a complete person. Usually internal needs, it's, it's a mental or physical wound, something they have to uh, address. It's usually less obvious, it's a little harder to figure out, but there is, in any good character, a, uh, uh, an internal need. Indiana Jones, he needs to believe in something more than himself. And so he, repeat, he repeatedly says, I don't believe in all this mumbo jumbo. He starts out there and ends up in a completely different place and he's helped by Miriam. Miriam teaches him to believe in love which is not science, and moves him along his arc into believing in, in something greater than himself, believing in the arc. So the internal need always goes back to a wound. Shrek doesn't believe he's worthy of love. Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg's need for acceptance in the social network. Uh, man, I, I could write a whole class just on wounds for uh, protagonists. Let's get back to Raider, so. So by the end of the movie, he has to have, you know, he has to uh, uh, get the arc. Uh, he has to resolve his internal need. And by the end of the movie, uh, he's telling Miriam, don't look at it. Because now he believes in something greater than himself. He believes in uh, the power of the arc. And who would look into the face of God? He believes it. He tells her to believe it. At the beginning of the movie, 
up to about uh, the midpoint. I mean, he's like uh, Belloc, the antagonist. I mean, he has no, <laughs> Belloc has no respect for the Ark at all. He thinks it's a transmitter to speak to God. So slowly but surely, Indiana moves towards believing in something greater than himself. Your characters need stuff, internal needs and external needs. And the connective tissue between the two is the central dramatic argument. It's what's known as uh, a character theme. It, it's, 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 it's as, it really, it's, it's as simple as that. You have to have an internal and external need. I'll show you how, how you weave those into a scene. If the scene is an external, uh, external need win for the character, it should be an internal need loss for the character. If the scene's an internal need win for the character, it should be an external need loss for the character. This creates thematic tension. Show you an example. It's a silly example, but uh, two rivals race tricycles from Los Angeles to New York. Let's call the protagonist John. He also wants to woo his true love. Let's call her Mary. So John has a clear external need, win the race. John has a clear internal need, win over Mary. So the first leg of the race, he beats his rival badly. During the victory, He's a pompous ass, which offends Mary. This is an external win, but an internal loss. The next leg of the race, John's out to a huge lead. He takes a moment to chat up Mary and steals a kiss. But it took too long to get that kiss, so he loses that leg of the race. This is an internal win, but an external loss. And this is what you want to keep doing with your theme again and again and again. People don't keep score, they feel what's happening. So the more times that you can put this into the same scene, the stronger people feel the theme. And I've never heard anyone in the history of ever say something like there's too much theme in this story. Here's a couple examples. Moonstruck, love the script. It's a great, great story. Loretta, she needs to marry Johnny, but she sleeps with Johnny's brother, Ronnie. Her internal need is passionate love, passion in her life. Her external need is to marry Johnny. She sleeps with Ronnie. This is a huge conflict thematically. It's, it's a, a, a hilarious scene because when, when Ronnie says, I love you, she slaps him in the face and says, snap out of it. She's logical, he's passionate. That's one of the great things about this screenplay is the men are, 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 are passionate and emotional and the women are all logical. It kind of flips the stereotype uh, <laughs> on, its, on its head. Another, oh, wrong way. Another example, uh, Field of Dreams. That's why men cry at the end of this. External loss, the farm. Internal win, reconciles with his father. Tying the characters into your theme just before they have to face their darkest fears, make the biggest sacrifices, uh, it just makes it a much more emotional ending for you. And typically what happens is the protagonist has to give up uh, their external need for an internal win. That's the, the horrible choice that they have to make at the end. And when they, they choose their internal need over their external need, you know, they're uh, rewarded handsomely. Or in a tragedy, they're punished horribly. Either way, it becomes a much more emotional ending. And we've been doing this for a super long time. In the child's, the Disney version of uh, the story of Pinocchio, Pinocchio saves Geppetto from Monstro the Whale, but drowns doing it. And external loss, sacrifices himself, internal win, becomes a real boy. Uh, in, the, in the original version of Pinocchio, it, it gets, it gets very dark. It's, it's definitely a different ending. But anyways, I, I just wanted to mention, this has been going on for a very long time. Uh, it's just classic storytelling. So using theme, tying theme to your characters and understanding theme uh, is so, so important for 
uh, not only uh, setting up the structure of, of your world, your characters, uh, but also your ending. It just makes it more emotional. So as I said, the protagonist was constantly be challenged by the theme. I want to show you an example of how uh, you can apply theme to basic structure. Now this uh, is a framework. I'm not going to read you this list because it's boring. I'm going to take you through it point by point. It's a framework that uh, that I first heard from Craig Mason on his podcast script notes. And here are a few examples. The protagonist lives in a world with an alternative or flawed theme. In As Good As It Gets, Melvin literally locks the world out. He's struggling with OCD and attacks people before they can hurt him. The deal he's made with himself to exist. He's living in an anti-theme. Then the protagonist is thrown into a situation that challenges their worldview. Tony agrees to drive Dr. Shirley. After being introduced to the new theme, they try it, but it doesn't work. Does anyone remember the, the song, the very first song that's played in Bohemian Rhapsody? Can anybody find me somebody to love? By the midpoint of the movie, the protagonist sees example of how their lives would improve if they embrace the new theme, and it inspires them. Like Arthur Fleck, who kills for the first time, and it really works out well for him. Finally, has the power and notoriety he craves. The protagonist half-heartedly embraces the new theme and it blows up in their face, like in Jojo Rabbit. After wooing Elsa, the Jewish girl in, living in the wall, Jojo's mother's killed for suspicion of sympathizing with Jews. Now they don't believe in the old, the protagonist doesn't believe in the old theme or the new theme, and they're about to face their worst fears, like Michael and Spotlight. The whole team knows that they're abusive priests in Boston, but also right in their very neighborhoods. But Robbie, his boss, doesn't want to rush the story. But in the end, the protagonist understands the theme and embraces it, and are rewarded. Like Rick, he finally sticks his neck out for someone and saves the world. He even shoots Major Strasser to cover their escape. Or they're punished horribly, like in Ford versus Ferrari. They understand the theme, embrace it, and they're punished. The end, Ken Miles decides to you know, go along with the corporate line after butting up against him the whole time, and uh, he doesn't win the race. They all come, come across a tie, and he technically doesn't win. So uh, that story is also uh, a dual protagonist. You know, Carol and uh, Miles are, are both uh, the protagonists in that. So theme works for dual protagonists, just like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kids. You know, the future's coming going to replace them. Their time is over. It works with an ensemble cast, except the Samurai. So let me show you how this, this works when you lay it up against uh, your classic three-act structure. So you start with the old theme, the anti-theme. They're living in a deal that they've cut with themselves to kind of get by. They're forced to change. That kind of feels like uh, the inciting incident in classic three-act structure terms. They're introduced to the theme. They test the theme. They see an example of, of this new theme that they haven't quite bought into, but it inspires them to give it another try. And their second test blows up in their face. So now they're stuck between the two themes. The original th theme back here doesn't work. The new theme isn't working. And they're in the parlance of Save the Cat, the bad guys are closing in. They're about to face their worst fears. Eventually, they commit to the new theme. And then we show them living in the new theme. The old world, where they first came from, we show them living in the new theme uh, at the end. That's a structure that's been with us for thousands and thousands of years. It's Returning to uh, the original place where the story began with a new perspective that's as old as the tales of Gilgamesh. Returning to Urk, written like four to 5,000 years ago. So this isn't new. This is something that's been going on for a very, very, very long time. So topics, topics are not themes. I want to make the point really clear. You, you, can, you can have a topic or you can have a theme, but a theme is much more developed. Uh, so for example, love. Love is a topic. You might write a theme like heartbreak is a debt owed to true love. Boy, that'd be a movie, right? Heartbreaking. 
Uh, so what I want, want to do is simply show you a bunch of topics and point out the difference. Topics, pick universal topics, things that, things that, that you're passionate about, you want to live in, uh, but never start writing without a topic. Have a topic in mind. I'm, I'm begging you. You don't have to have a theme in mind, but have a topic in mind that you're writing to. So by the end of your story, if you don't have a theme, uh, it'll start to emerge for you if you're, if you're disciplined and writing to a topic. Now, the difference between a topic and a theme is something like this, good and evil. Uh, different themes for uh, the topic of good and evil would be uh, good and evil are the opposite sides of the same coin. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The only thing necessary for evil uh, for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. It was kind of cliched, but I mean, why not? <laughs> I mean, you don't need a deep topic, especially for a comedy. I, I really don't think you need a deep topic for uh, a deep, deep uh, uh, theme for uh, a comedy. Uh, I re write in cliches when I start and then slowly over time, a more profound theme, a deeper theme, the theme that I'm truly writing starts to emerge. But no one's quizzing me on what my theme is. Uh, so it, when you go out and write a hit movie, you probably want to polish up your cliche you know, when you're on Good Morning America and you could say something elegant because we're all writers and so we can have a very, a very polished theme for you know, the audiences. But to write the story, if you don't have a super polished, refined, dignified, poetic theme, I think it's going to be just fine. Just write it and the more poetic version will emerge. I did one other page just to, to bury the point home. Happiness, happiness, not, not having to say what you want. It's one of what you have. Uh, happiness is fleeting. I mean, there's, there's a difference between a theme and a topic. Start with a topic. I think you're going to be just fine if you're just starting with theme. But they become different stories. For example, the tricycle race, I could write it as a maturation story using that as the topic. And then uh, my theme would be something like John must stop acting childish and learn uh, what it is to be a man before he can ever earn the love of Mary. That's one story. But then I could write it as a revenge thing. And John has no room in his heart for Mary because it's filled with hate for his rival. That's a very different story. Or greed. John must realize there's more to life than money. So your themes are going to take you in different directions, depending on which one you choose. So a lot of people want to know what the theme of what they just wrote is, or they're watching a movie or reading a script and they're trying to figure out where's the theme, what's the theme. They're, they're not hidden. Let me show you how you get to them. Sometimes a protagonist is just going to tell you. So in The Incredibles, Helen says, Bob, if we work together, we can do anything. I mean, she's literally just telling you the theme. Again, it's, it's a comedy. Sometimes the antagonist tells you. In the original Blade Runner, Roy Batty uh, you know, basically says what it means to be alive. All those memories will be lost in time, like tears in rain. A lot of times, if a creature is drawn in the sky or the water, I mean, wise men, animals, elders, children, magical creatures, like Grand Poppy in, in, in uh, the troll in Frozen, he's conjuring images in the sky. Listen for theme, theme's coming. And that's why I love, I love Frozen. They told us the opposite of the theme in what they were saying. Fear is the enemy. Translation, love is your friend. Because in this story, everything gets flipped on its head. And what I love about it is love is your friend. And in most princess fairy tale kind of stories, it's a man's love that saves the princess. In this one, it's the love of her sister, which is just beautiful. Just, I, I love, love this story. So what they did is they reversed and turned on its head, you know, what, what the theme was, fear is the enemy when actually it's the, the reverse what you should be taking away. It's just, it's a wonderfully, wonderfully drawn uh, script. And then subplots. Subplots, in my opinion, are the easiest way to figure out the theme because the subplots of a well-written script are the same theme as the, the main narrative. So if you, you just look at your subplots 
and then uh, figure out what's the commonality between the two, hello, there's the theme. So like in Judy, the, the uh, 2019 film about Judy Garland, she befriends a gay couple, Stan and Dan, subplot you know, of two minor characters, it's really similar to hers. They don't have control of their fate. So it's a really uh, simple way to uh, identify theme with your friend figured out in your script, when you're watching movies, et cetera. So Kristen, I was ho hoping you could help me out with this section. Uh, All righty. A few questions uh, you want to ask yourself when you're looking for theme. Okay. Uh, what did the protagonist learn at the end of the story? Humility. Okay. How did the protagonist change over the story? Started selfish and became self-sacrificing. What common issue is the protagonist constantly wrestling with? Acceptance. What are, the, what are most of the scenes really about? Commitment. What is the biggest issue between most of the characters? Control. And what makes the protagonist vulnerable? Loneliness. What is the protagonist's wound? Abandonment. What do the protagonist and the antagonist have in common? Obsession. What do the world and the protagonist have in common? Apathy. Why did the protagonist finally decide to act? Honor. Early in the story, why did the protagonist not act? Shame. So, uh, that's the end of the presentation. We can take some questions, and then what I want to do is save some time to uh, take, a, uh, take a, a dive into a few scripts that, that were sent, one or two of those. But uh, for now, how about if... Uh, yeah, so um, let, let me go ahead and start there. Um, I see that Jeff has a sim, uh, very similar question to my own. Um, and that was going to be about um, television. So you showed us three, a theme structure and the arc of how the character came to embrace the theme. Um, so how would that work for a series? At what point um, do, does the protagonist um, continue to cycle because they don't ever get to that end where they fully commit? Right, but they're constantly challenged by the theme. Right, so would that be like, the second test blows up, like at what point in that slide would yeah, they cycle? That, with, with that, what I was showing you there, that is a, a classic uh, movie structure. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with television, there's so many different structures to them. If it's a procedural, it's one thing. Uh, it, I mean, there's just so many different, your, your pilot is going to be different than your, uh, than your second episode. So uh, no, uh, th that structure would not apply to a, uh, a television show. Tele, tele, might might apply to a television pilot, but uh, yeah, do, apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and will those slides be available? Yeah. Okay. Um, if anybody else has a question, raise raise your hand, and I'll I'll look through and see if I see anybody there. Uh, Sky. Okay. Let me unmute you. Thanks. Um, this is really valuable. Thank you. I was wondering uh, how, so if you have a particularly dark theme or you're tending towards tragedy, um, what are strategies for maintaining audience engagement uh, and not making it feel very hopeless? Well, it depends on, on where they're going to, they're going to arc. They, they're going to start good and move towards uh, uh, bad or they're going to, well, they could, could start bad and move to worse. Uh, there, there's plenty of examples like that. Uh, but the idea of theme is not really going to come into play with uh, what your, uh, what the likability of your character. Your character, uh, people need to understand your character, not, not necessarily uh, like they need to understand their motivation. They need to understand that they're, they're living in this world that can't be maintained and they need to continually move towards and try to resolve uh, 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 the theme and live in a less compromised world, live in a world that is more uh, closer to the theme. But they're constantly going to 
pound their head up against the wall. They'll make certain progress, but they'll never, in a, especially a television show, never fully uh, get there because once they get there, it's it's like uh, it's like a, a, a couple that are trying to get together, and all the tension is: Are they going to get together? Are they not going to get together? And as soon as they get together, it's like you've let all the air out of the balloon. So you you const, you never you keep moving the goalposts for them. So there's always the tension that they're trying to chase that 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 uh, that perfection, be it good, be it bad. Okay. Do we have more questions? Anybody? Hand up. <laughs> Tiffany, you have a question? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, how do you articulate the theme, especially an internal um, internal theme uh, within the first five pages? I have struggled with this in my story, and I think most of you have read most of it. And I think I finally got it, an internal struggle um, and a sense of security, which I didn't expect. Uh, how do you describe that at the very beginning without it being too cliche or anything like that? Yeah, with, with uh, like a, a silly comedy animated, it, I, I think it's fine to come right out and have a character say it. Like with The Incredibles, they they literally just tell you. But having a but but when you're doing with the more nuanced material or drama, uh, often I'll, you want to imply it, you want to show it, you want to show them having frustration uh, with things. For example, as as good as it gets during the opening sequence he's washing his hands repeatedly with multiple bars of soap he's turning lights on um, so we can see that he has a wound that he's person. putting in a stasis of you know uh locking people out he's 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 germaphobic he's he's he, he's got a serious issue and that's that's like page one of the script mm -hmm. you don't have to establish it you know in the first five pages you got to get to it pretty pretty Soon because people okay. want to know what it is. So uh, okay. minor characters, minor characters are another way of, of doing it. Having uh, having children say something in passing or just a minor character showing uh, uh, idyllically how, how they uh, ideally how they should be living. Uh, so I prefer subtle, real subtle for uh, uh, drama, comedy. Okay. Nah, I, I just have characters say I wrote a comedy. Uh, pilot and the uh, and the uh, antagonist literally comes up and say it together. People are people can do anything. Okay, I rarely write. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, okay, uh, looks like um, Adam, you have a question. Uh, go ahead. Mine was pretty parallel to this. It was just um, any examples that we might have come across where theme does get. I, I, I've noticed sometimes where I'm tempted to hint at it or give us kind of a framework for it at the beginning. But toward the later on, we're kind of like, okay, now I get what we're really, what they're really learning is, you know, we thought they were kind of on this journey, but we see that the actual real purpose of that is blah at the end. So we're um, kind of getting to it in a different way. And I'm kind of wondering when that's straying and making us too loose of a framework and when that's like has been woven in artfully in any examples where like, okay, here's where they kind of take us on a path. But at the end, we're going, what they're really learning is something slightly different. Yeah, uh, another another thing you see a lot are, are uh, you know, the friend, the trusted friend, uh, or you know, the drunk scene. Uh, you know, they're they're drunk and telling each other the truth, or who's the truth teller in this person's life? You know, is, is it their uh, is it their sponsor? Is it their mother? You know, and they ask them the question. They don't say the theme, but they ask them the question, and they don't even have to, the protagonist doesn't have to answer it. It's just the question is being posed. Why are you doing that? So that we can see, they should be doing the opposite of that. I I, I always like me personally. I, I like writing the opposite because it conveys the information in a much more subtle way. And if I need to boost it up, I'll have someone ask the question. You know, if it's gotten so subtle that people aren't aren't following, then yeah, you need little tricks to to boost the uh, uh, the theme up just a bit. Okay, Brian. It looked like you had a question. Oh no, I actually. Uh, if it's all right, I had a couple of uh, examples for Adam's question, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, Adam, um, check out the movie A Quiet Place if you haven't yet. 
Uh, that's a good one where the theme is, isn't is always directly stated, but there's several incidents, and I don't want to say too much because it's really, if you haven't seen it yet, it's really good, and I don't want to spoil it for you, but um, a lot of the visual choices John Krasinski makes as a director, along with uh, in bringing that script to life, are about kind of about the whole theme of family. It's really, A Quiet Place is really all about family and the and the bond and how those bonds are tested in different ways, you know, and how they finally reveal the truth to each other about how they really feel about each other, how they love each other. So that's woven throughout the film. And it's, it's also great because it's, it's an, it's a bar barely an hour and a half long. So, you know, you can see they pack a lot of that visual reference into it. So that would be like a really good one for you, Adam, that I think might kind of give you some examples. Thank, thank you for that, Brian. I see you also put a couple of things in, in chat as well. Yeah, um, the TV yeah. question and another theme one for movies where it's not always stated, but, you know, so. Yeah. Great. Uh, Wally, it looked like you had a question. Yeah, yeah uh, Mike, you say that you alternate where the, the pro tag wins and then he loses and then he wins and then he loses. <clears throat> Is, there, is it all right if he loses, he loses, then he wins, and then he loses and loses and wins, or, or do I have to alternate them one after the other? Nope. The, the, the key is, 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 is not how many times they, it, there's an external win or an internal loss. It's okay. simply getting those two together. If you can put them in the same, thing, in, in the same scene, or, or at the very least put them in scenes right next to each other so people see the connection, the consequences, that's your only goal. Doesn't doesn't matter. It could be external win, internal loss for a whole sequence. That 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 supports the rule that I've been working with for years: is put your protagonist in a tree and then throw rocks at him. So sure, that's what I try to do. <laughs> right. Any any other questions, Andreessen? No. Okay, uh, should we move on to the script analysis? Sure. Okay, just a couple of things about uh, the analysis. Uh, we asked people to send in 10 pages. So this is analysis of the 10 pages. It's not the whole screenplay because we don't have the whole screenplay. So it could go off in a, a different direction after the 10 pages. And so all we're gonna do is be looking at the 10 pages and, and, and uh, identify theme in these. And uh, themes are like a complex wine. So there's, there's many interpretations of the theme. We should be able to identify the topic though. Uh, so there could be uh, nuanced uh, differences uh, between our interpretation of, of what the theme is. The correct theme is always what the writer believes. So what we're gonna do is we're going to read the script aloud. I'm gonna give you my analysis uh, and then kind of break down the theme or themes inside of it, make suggestions on how we can push the theme up a little bit more. Uh, and then uh, as a group participation, I'd like uh, all of us to come up with a theme. What do they think the theme is? And uh, I think that might, uh, uh, might, might help the writer. Uh, they might, uh, might already know strongly what their theme is but uh, I think it would be a fantastic exercise. Mike, are you reading this or are you casting? I was hoping I could maybe get someone just to read, read oh, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 would anyone be up for reading uh, the first script? First hand was Jeff. So how about I put this up? This is, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Sky Gilbert for sending in NG, uh, INGO. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the first 10 pages of this. This is a 60 minute uh, uh, television pilot. And I am going to uh, figure out which screen that is. That one I do believe. And let me get that all on one page. And uh, Kristen, is, is that clear? Is that, is that coming across? Yes, it's good to me. Okay, if you could unmute Mr. Miller. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Uh, and take it away. 
Fade in interior exterior car East Africa day. A compact car careens down the stunning East African coastline. Mohammed, early 20s, steers with his entire wiry frame. His mouth firms into a line as he navigates potholes. He swerves dramatically. A woman crossing the road startles as the car narrowly misses her. The water she's carrying on her head sloshes. The car flies past a faded sign that reads, Moenza, two kilometers. Mohammed impatiently taps the steering wheel. The car screeches to a stop. Cattle slowly cross the road. Mohammed glares at the herd and honks. He opens the car door, picks up a stick, and maniacally directs the herd off the road. Finally, a narrow stretch clears. Mohammed gets in the car and roars past. East African village day, a dusty one street town. Local shoppers move slowly along a row of roadside vendors. Clusters of mud huts are scattered behind the main drag. This is Moenza. The compact car swerves onto an open patch of dirt by the vegetable vendor. Mohammed gets out and locks the door. He pulls a small piece of paper out of his pocket. That's all I got on this page. I'm not seeing the whole page yet. Uh, can you see it now? Nope. Let me make sure that my... my uh... No, it does go down a little bit. Let me stop sharing and get back into it. Okay. See if that will solve the problem. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Uh, Pocket. Okay. Muhammad approaches the vendor and refers to the paper as he asks a question. The vendor gestures down the road. Muhammad begins to jog. Exterior mud hut day. Muhammad arrives breathless. Ruby, four, is si sitting just in front of the open entrance, drawing in the dirt. Muhammad squats in front of Ruby, agitated. Mohammed, where's Precious? Your mother-in-law, your mother, where is she? Ruby regards Mohammed warily. I'm looking for Precious, is she home? Your mama, is your mama home? A, a chair scrapes against a dirt floor. Mohammed rises. A foreboding man, Sovello, early 30s, emerges from the hut. Ruby looks up solemnly. Sovello looms over Mohammed, threatening close, threateningly close. Mohammed holds his ground, straight-spined and wide-eyed. Interior Executive Office, U U.S. Day. Sharon, 60s, a lady of piercing charisma, sits behind a Zanzibar-carved desk. Catherine, 40, stately, well-dressed with a professorial air, is seated in the chair across from Sharon. Sharon, you can't postpone the research. Catherine, we have to publish by December no extensions, Sharon. And why again are you short staffed? Catherine, malaria. I'm down two researchers. I need at least one more. Sharon, we don't have anyone on such short notice, Catherine. What about the new hire, Emily? She did phenomenal work at Doctors Without Borders. Sharon looks away, thinking. Sharon, Emily is qualified, but she's a bit of a maverick. People who thrive in war zones. Defeated Sai, is there anyone else who can help you with this? Meeting room, USA Day. Emily, 30, sits across from Catherine in a dingy meeting room. She's intense, energetic, and barely adherent to the professional standards of dress. Emily, I would love to help you with this, Catherine. Great. I've never worked as a psychologist before. Emily, psychiatrist. Catherine, right. Have you ever done a household survey? Emily, I did home visits in Afghanistan, but that was to provide care, Catherine. Okay, this will be different. You don't provide care. Emily, what if the children need care? Catherine, you'll direct them to their local health center. Emily, ah, Catherine, not the same as a war zone, I'd imagine. So we haven't talked to timing. Can you get on a plane next week? Emily, yes. Catherine, just yes. No need to check in with the, with the family. Emily, nope. Catherine, no other concerns or questions. Emily, no, am I helping people? Catherine, you at yes. Emily, that's all I need to know. Montage, Catherine and Emily travel to Kenya at the airport destination hall. Catherine prints her ticket 
from a check-in kiosk. She turns to Emily, whose wallet is splayed out on a kiosk as Emily searches for her ID. At the security conveyor belts, Catherine methodically removes liquids, laptop, belt, cardigan, and an e-book from various places. Emily opens one backpack compartment and dumps its co contents on the tray. At a newsstand, Catherine picks up the, econ the Economist while Emily picks up a paperback thriller. On the plane, Catherine is properly settled into an economy window seat while Emily chaotically settles a, into the same row, three seats away. Catherine curls her lip and, and montage. Interior, exterior, thrive for all office, Nairobi day. A large gated house in a nice neighborhood. Multiple cars are parked in the driveway. Inside, the house has been converted to an office space. The dining room has a large conference table at the center. Emily Muhammad and eight Kenyan researchers circle the table. Catherine presents from the head of the table. Catherine, Dr. Emily Green has stepped in at the last minute to help with the survey, and Mr. Muhammad Mbin, oh boy, Mbin Sai. Close enough. Close enough. We'll do translation for Emily. Join me in welcoming, welcoming our newest team members murmurs of hello and karibu from the researchers. Exterior Savannah Day, Catherine gives instructions to Emily, Mohammed, and the research team under a big tree by a road. Five jeeps are parked nearby. Finally, I know this is hard work. When you get tired or tempted to skip a household or deviate from the protocol, remember this. Thousands of children die every year before they ever reach a health facility. Together we can find out why and help change things for the better. Hey, Boo Twen Day. The meeting breaks. Researchers get into Jeeps in pairs. Catherine randomly picks a pair and gets into the Jeep with them. Into your extra Jeep day. Mohammed is driving on the Savannah. Emily is in the passenger seat next to him. Emily, so whose writing did you fall in love with? Mohammed, I'm sorry? Which author moved you so deeply that you had a major in English? I wanted a job. There was a high demand for translation. That may be true, and as English majors are wont to do, you fell in love with someone's writing, right? Whose? A long pause. Mohammed. The two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I'm working with a poet. I'll be a good translator. I'm glad you like poetry, not worried. We can swap stanzas on these long rides. Darkly lit mud hut. A young mother indicates space on woven mats. Emily and Mohammed sit alongside the mother. A two-year-old is asleep on the mat nearby. As Emily speaks, she refers to the printed question, questionnaire on her clipboard. Mohammed leans in to the young mother and simul translates into Swahili in a low murmur. Emily, hello, my name is Emily Green. I am working with Thrive for All. We are conducting a survey about children's child health all over Kenya. I would like to ask you some questions about your house. Rural courtyard. Emily, Ma Muhammad, and Anissa, 45, are sitting under a tree in the shade with seven kids playing nearby. Emily looks at the seven children, flexes her writing hand, and removes the cap from her pen. Mohammed begins simul-translating as Emily speaks. Emily, please give the names of the persons who usually live in your household and guests of household who stayed here last night. Anissa smiles as Mohammed's translation finishes. She holds up her fist, extending a digit for each member of her family. Anissa, Priscilla, 14, female. Daniel, 12, male. Mercy, 12, female. Martha, 11, female. Large mud, interior large mud hut. Mohammed and the noticeably pregnant Makina, 20, are sitting on mats with Emily on a stool. A layer of dust sits over the room and a few messy piles litter the floor. Mohammed simul translates and tr responds on behalf of Makina. Emily notes responses on her questionnaire. Emily, where do you receive uh, antenatal care for this pregnancy? Mohammed, her mother-in-law and a local spiritual leader. Anywhere else? No. Is this your first pregnancy? As Muhammad finishes translating, Makina becomes very still. 
Eyes downturned. No. How many miscarriages, abortions, and stillbirths have you had? Muhammad finishes translating, and Makina is non-responsive. Muhammad tries to solicit an answer. A tear runs down Makina's cheek. Emily flips through the questionnaire, searching. Her brow furrows as she reads. Makina begins to sob soundlessly. Emily looks at Muhammad, incredulous. Emily, protocol says we classify this as a non-answer and keep asking questions. I will try. I will try to get answers for you. No, Muhammad. That's Emily. Lets out a frustrated sigh. She looks at Makina, begins to reach out her hand, and draws back. Jeep day. Muhammad is driving on a long, straight, dusty savanna road. Emily sits in the passenger seat, frowning. Do health centers have therapists? Why would they need that? Muhammad, the girl is depressed. It's normal to grieve. Grief shouldn't be debilitating. She needs faith and family. For her, that might not be enough. Exterior roadside cafe. Parked jeeps are lined up in the dirt next to a bustling cafe. The research team, including Catherine, Emily, and Muhammad, are finishing lunch on a dusty patio. Emily, Catherine, if we see a mental health issue, what can we do to help? Catherine, urge them to seek care at the local health center. That's the protocol. Emily's brow furrows and she fidgets with her fork, thinking. Concrete hut, day. Emily, Muhammad, and Khadija, 30, sit around the table with small cups of tea. Khadija is well-dressed with a loosely tied scarf covering her neck. Muhammad simul transmits. Em Emily, in general, would you say that Adamu's health is very good, good, moderate, bad, or very bad? Muhammad, good. Emily, has, Ad has Aduma had diarrhea in the past two uh, weeks? Yeah. Yes. Did you seek advice or treatment for the diarrhea from any source? No, the line was too long, four hour wait. He recovered on his own. As Muhammad translates, Khadija's scarf begins to slip, revealing bruises wringing her neck. Muhammad averts his gaze. Emily looks at the swollen, colorful neck in horror. Khadija dips her head down and her hand goes up to the scarf. Emily grabs Khadija's hand. They look at each other for a mo long moment. Emily wraps Khadija into a warm hug. Khadija stiffens and slowly relaxes, arms coming around to hold Emily tightly. Muhammad watches, horrified. Jeep, day. Muhammad is driving through a mid-sized town near a lake. He is frowning. Emily sits in the passenger seat, smiling. Muhammad, you are not supposed to touch the subjects. People, it's against protocol. Fuck protocol. You're going to get us fired. We're going to find a way to help these women. Muhammad stares at the road ahead. Mouth in a thin line. Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful read. Thank you. Thank you, Sky. Very nice pages. So what I'd like to do now is I uh, don't want to get into formatting issues or character development or or you know so, some of the other things that we we could be uh, talking about with this script. I really want to zoom in on theme and talk about theme uh, itself. So I, I, I want to wanna give, uh, uh, just point out some, some different things that uh, uh, I was seeing when I went through and, and, and read this. Uh, and uh, let me just share uh, that page with you. Uh, there is definitely a new world, old world theme that's going on. Uh, Compact cars, potholes. She's uh, uh, she's carrying water on her head. There's cattle in the road. It's a dusty uh, one street town. Clusters of mud huts versus a compact car, which is technology, which is newer, drawing in the dirt. I mean, there's just example after example from huts, well dressed researchers, uh, doctors without borders. That's kind of more of a modern uh, technology thing dingy meeting room. So I wanted to uh, just acknowledge quickly that there is that theme that's going on. You can have multiple themes going on uh, in there. But what I wanted to do was take a deeper dive uh, into uh, the second theme, which is more of the dominant theme, which is the, uh, I would say, the, the character theme. 
And uh, let's take a, a deeper look in that. And that is which one of these things that I've got going on. I have so many things open, stand by. I think it is this one. It is. Can everyone see the yellow? No, the wrong one. Let me highlight the right one. That one there. Okay. So this is the theme I think I'd like to, to take a little bit more time with uh, because it's, it's Muhammad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through the first three pages because those might confuse us. Those are a, a, a flash forward. And I'd like to start with in the meeting room U.S. day because this is, this is more the beginning of Muhammad's journey. He's living in the anti-theme. He is all about job and duty. Emily is about to introduce him to the theme. Muhammad's uh, exterior need is to job and duty. His interior need is respect for humanity. And Emily is going to embody that. Catherine embodies duty to him. Uh, Emily is, is going to uh, teach, him the, uh, teach him the theme, teach him compassion. She is his muse. And uh, she's going to get him to embrace the poet in, in his life. So examples of this. Uh, interior and exterior needs are humanity, more humanity, office space is duty. He's going to be a translator for Emily. That's his job. I know it's hard work. So whose writings did you fall in love with? This whole scene is just wonderful because it's the, the clash between I wanted a job there's a high demand for translators, and she's trying to talk to him about being, you know, what, what did he fall in love with? And so all of this is just, you know, I'll be a good translator. I'm, I'm working with the poet, I'll be a good translator. Thematically, this has wonderful tension in it, and it's on page, page six, so we're very early on. Moving forward, she's doing her job, he's doing his job, and eventually we get to the point where there's a conflict between the two. Protocol says we classify this as a non-answer. I'll try to get answers for you. No, there's a thematic clash between here and that's why this, this scene turns out so good. It ramps up later. Well, it, it continues on with this. Emily wants to get clarification from Catherine. Again, Catherine embodies duty and the job, but Emily is far more interested in humanity and doing the right, right thing for people who are right in front of them. So by the time we get to Emily grabs, uh, uh, I'm struggling with that name, uh, her hand for a long moment, we're again underlining she is all about humanity and she is going to teach Muhammad about humanity. He's of course horrified because you're not supposed to touch the subjects. People, not subjects, people. is against protocol. That's his job, that's his duty. Fuck protocol. She is dead set against the rules when it comes up against humanity. You're going to get us fired. So theme is just uh, laced throughout this. Uh, the secondary theme of new and old worlds colliding, uh, but uh, the interior and exterior needs of, uh, of Muhammad are present throughout this whole thing. In the first three pages, he is changed by this point in the story. And once we catch up to this point, we'll see that he's rushing to try and get to Precious. And so all this is just, he's hurrying, things are slowing him down. Uh, he's breathless. He's desperately trying to get to Precious. And then he's going to hold his ground, straight spine and wide eyed because he has learned something from Emily about how important it is to embrace you, your humanity. So as I was uh, talking about earlier, that's the subject, duty versus humanity. That, 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 that's the topic or the subject. But what would be a good theme for this? So I'd like everyone to kind of think about that and let's suggest different themes 
for her. What is the connective tissue between duty and humanity? So uh, let's start us out with a future without empathy is no future. You see how you could write that? Humanity is everyone's primary responsibility. We are more than our job. Okay, so what, what are some themes that, that uh, got a lot of brain power here? Looks like Tiffany has a, a suggestion. Okay. Go for Tiffany. Uh, I keep going on, I don't know if it's a topic or a theme or one could lead to the other, but uh, the clash of worlds. You have a girl, the one question that stood out for me is talking about an abortion. And she's talking about an abortion in a Muslim majority country, which I think is still illegal according to Islamic creed. And so maybe it could be humanity and the clash of cultures. Um, what defines humanity? How far does, um, where does humanity start? Where does tradition stop and humanity start? Could be sure. something along those lines. Sure, good idea. Anyone else? Ideas? Compassion trumps duty. Change has no friends. Have a, if you have a suggestion, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. Nope. Looks like, looks like Adam does. Oh. Having a problem with. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, I don't. I was like, you muted. I muted. We, we did it at the same time. Um, I don't have this in a sentence yet, but I'm noticing the tension between the big picture health improvement, like we want to save the world on a statistical big picture survey, you know, while ignoring the patient in front of us. So it seems like the message here is you can't, you know, save the world at a, you know, can't save humanity without saving the people in front of you, without noticing the patient in front of you. It's at least a motif, if not a theme. Sure, sure. Most definitely. Okay, Randy, did you have a question? You, did, uh, did, did, did you have a theme? Oh, I thought I saw your hand up. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? Thoughts? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I wrote some stuff down in chat, but I was, um, I guess I can summarize. I wrote down some topics and I also wrote down two possible themes. The first of which is doing the right thing doesn't always mean following the rules. That could be a very conflict based thing. And the yeah. second is do you be damned when people need help? Yeah, sure. Sure. Excellent. There are no wrong answers. These are just suggestions. Anyone else? Okay, what, what I'd like to do is, is uh, show a few examples of where we might uh, bump up the, uh, uh, the theme a little bit in, uh, just in, uh, in, in different ways. So let me share screen again. And So you should be able to see this. So on page on page one, uh, by this point, Muhammad has evolved somewhat. So he's trying to find precious. So uh, maybe rather than just jogging away from the vendor, he shows him respect, shakes his hand, or what is whatever is culturally appropriate at that time. So that could be a stronger theme. Uh, rather than just looking away, Sharon could close a laptop. Again, that's technology, a secondary theme. Or on page five, in the office space, space what technology is there? Uh, Catherine on page five at the bottom, she randomly picks a pair. I'm not, I, I think that's a conflict with the theme, which if, if this is an important thing, I'd, I'd keep it. But uh, Catherine seems calculated, um, I, I might, change that line. Uh, page seven, she's the only luxury she can afford. So again, just bumping up more of the, of the new world versus old world. Uh, none of this, I'm not saying that any of this at all is written, written wrong. These are just examples of how you might elevate the theme more by putting it into uh, uh, scene description, action lines, uh, things like that. 
So I think we have, unless, uh, are there any other uh, thoughts on, on uh, theme ideas we might offer Scott? Any more? All right, then I think we have uh, uh, enough time. We can move on to a, a second one. Let's, Tiffany, did you have one more? Uh, I think Brian? we can, as much as culture can pull us apart, what connects us? Because I was just thinking about the dialogue, Muhammad recites a poem and Elizabeth finishes it. It's a tried and true truth, but sometimes if employed right, it works and this works. It's also about what connects us. Uh -huh. Excellent. Looks like Brian also has this at this one. I was going to suggest too that maybe it's kind of a one person who is unorthodox and challenges the thinking of the establishment finally finds a way to solve the problem too because every you know nobody else in the script really thinks or approaches these problems the way Emily is so that might be a, a something to you know food for thought I guess sure okay. sure Thanks everybody for your suggestions. Thanks to Jeff for reading and thank you Sky for offering up your script. Yeah, so uh, I think, think we have time we can do one more. Uh, so I need a, a, another volunteer to read 10 pages. I know it's a lot. Uh, looks like Brian is offering. Okay, yeah. Let me... Uh, Pull that one up for us real quick. Do, 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 do. And that, I've done that twice, so that is there. And stand by, here we go. Okay, you should see the purple possum. Yep, written by Catherine, Catherine Sotol. Yes. Sorry if, I, sorry if I mispronounced that, Catherine. So stand by and I will Scroll down, and whenever you're ready. Okay. Black. Lee, voiceover. You might think owning a toy store is all fun and games, but it's a tough racket. Fade in. Interior, looking out a diner window, 7 a.m., raining. Across the street, a crew of workers replaces a neon sign that reads The Jet City with another that reads Santa's Workshop. Lee, a 40-ish hard-boiled toy store owner, sits in a window booth. Ambidextrous, she tightly tugs on her right earlobe with her right hand and holds her coffee cup with her left. An adult wearing an anonymous hippopotamus costume walks past the window. Lee sees him but doesn't react. Wallace, that weirdo better not try walking in here. Lee looks up to see Wallace, white, the waiter, standing beside the table. Lee, they're harmless. He's skeptical, lifts the coffee pot. Wallace, want that heated up? A 1990s television set mounted on the wall behind Wallace airs a tape of President Clinton holding a press conference. The Chiron reads, more on Y2K coming up. Lee, thanks. Wallace pours. Lee, continued. Oh, wait, I have something for your daughter. Lee turns to the fedora and trench coat beside her, pulls a small stuffed llama out of a coat pocket, and hands the toy to Wallace. Wallace, no drama llama. Thanks. She'll love it. But it's not a purple possum. Lee, the purple possum is a myth. Wallace, it's worth a fortune. I could retire and travel around the world. Lee, it's not. 20 collectors, thuggish suburban moms, walk into the diner. Anna Mae, Asian, mid-30s, wears a pinstripe suit with a skirt. Dorothy, African-American, late 20s, has her name in studs on the back of her leather jacket. Gloria White, mid-50s, wearing a reservoir dog suit with pedal pushers and carrying a violin case-shaped purse, is clearly the leader. Lee continued, why are the collectors here? Wallace, they meet before going to the store. Lee, which store? Wallace, whichever got a shipment. Wallace walks off to greet Gloria and lead the collectors to the private dining room. Lee goes back to pulling her earlobe. Fade. Lee stands at the counter, chatting with the cashier. She turns her head, looks into the private dining room, and sees Wallace sell the toy llama to Anna Mae. Lee, voiceover. How do the collectors know which store just got a shipment? Tugging on her right earlobe, she turns to leave. Interior. Wondersley's World Back Room, 7.30 a.m., same day. 
At his desk, Mr. Keyes, Asian, mid-60s store manager, looks at a 1995 computer monitor and talks on a landline. A large page-a-day calendar reading Tuesday and nothing else hangs on a wall. Uh, Easy Romeo, African-American, mid-20s, toy store clerk, plays with a beautiful handmade paddle ball. He paddles under one leg, over his head, behind his back, Mr. Keyes on the phone. I'm telling you, the shipment is sure for paddle balls. Son, do you understand the difference between inaccurate data and reality? Lee walks in the back door, hangs up her coat and hat, then takes a yo-yo out of one coat pocket. Easy waves the paddle at her. Lee, good morning, Romeo. Mr. Keys on the phone. How's that? Easy tilts his head toward Mr. Keys. Easy, Romeo. Mr. Keys is fighting the good fight. Lee winks and with great expertise performs complicated tricks with the yo-yo. Mr. Keys, well, you're going to make it right. Four Mr. Paddles delivered by the end of the week and you pay the freight or you'll be getting another phone call. Mr. Keys hangs up and turns towards Lee and Easy. Lee and Easy continue playing. Lee, you're a big meanie. Easy Romeo, reality is overrated. Mr. Keys, reality has a nasty habit of asserting itself. Barbara, white, mid-40s, the, the uniformed freight driver, uh, walks in the back, drawer, uh, back door, carrying a cardboard box and a baguette. Mr. Keys takes the paddle ball away from EZ and begins sending the ball over and under Lee's yo-yo. EZ greets Barbara. Barbara waves to Mr. Keys and Lee. They wave back. Lee, don't get tangled in my string. Mr. Keys, when in your entire life has that happened? EZ signs for the package. Barbara leaves. He carries the package and the baguette to the stock table. Easy Romeo, it's precious plushy. The yo-yo immediately slaps back into Lee's hand. Mr. Keys catches the ball. They turn and look at the box. Lee, the little critter's line? Mr. Keys, let's see. Mr. Keys takes out a box knife, efficiently opens the box, and dumps about 15 toys onto the table. They quickly go through the pile, organizing the toys by species. Easy Romeo, I got no drama llama. Lee, two anonymous hippopotamuses. Unnoticed by the others, Kathleen White, mid-50s, walks in the back door wearing a pink sharkskin uh, sh sleeveless vest and matching pants. She carries a violin case-shaped purse and has a nicotine patch on one arm. Mr. Keys, the rest are old. Candy Kangaroo has been out for 10 months. Kathleen, well, why don't you order more recent models? Easy and Lee spin around surprised. Mr. Keys is not surprised. Uh, easy Romeo, uh, ma'am, you can't be back here. We're not even, Mr. Keys, easy, easy. Kathleen Brackett, this is Ezekiel Romeo, one of our clerks. Easy sticks out his hand to shake, but Catherine looks at Lee and misses the introduction. Easy drops his hand. And this is Wanda Lee Wondersley, owner of Wondersley's World. Lee, Kathleen. Kathleen puts out her hand to shake Lee's. Lee stares at her. Kathleen drops her hand. Kathleen to Lee. So, order some of the newer products in the Little Critters line. What about the purple possum? Lee, the purple possum is a myth. Easy Romeo, we can order anything we want, but that has nothing to do with what actually arrives. Lee, or when it arrives. Mr. Keys, or how much arrives. Kathleen, that's ridiculous. Precious plushie can't keep up with the man. They throw some little critters in a box and toss it in a truck. Kathleen reaches into her purse and pulls out a small gray stuffed toy with button eyes. Kathleen, well, in that case, we should carry these so customers don't leave empty handed. Easy Romeo, looking at Lee. We? Lee looks at Mr. Keys and begins tugging on her right earlobe. Mr. Keys, we don't carry Gutman stuffed. Kathleen throws the toy to Lee, who, still tugging on her earlobe, catches it with her left hand. Kathleen, why not? Leo throws the toy to EZ. Lee, Romeo, please critique this toy. Kathleen reacts to the Romeo. EZ Romeo. This is a Gutman stuff. Lee, what does that mean? EZ Romeo, it was made in China. Lee, by EZ Romeo, children. Lee, continue. Easy Romeo, this is a Gutman stuff. He looks up for help. Mr. Keys, Triceratops? Easy Romeo, Elephant? Lee, Armadillo. Kathleen, it's a rhinoceros, of course. Easy Romeo, this is a Gutman stuffed rhinoceros? Lee, of course. Easy Romeo, okay. This is a Gutman stuffed rhinoceros. The fabric is really thin and the one of the rhinoceros's eyes pops off and flies through the air. 
Lee choking hazard. Slapping their hands over their mouths, everyone drops to the floor. The eye bounces off a wall, flies back over their heads, lands on the floor, and does a couple of lazy circles before falling over. They eye the eye warily. Lee, clear. They slowly stand, keeping their hands over their mouths and their eyes on the eye. Not until they are fully standing do they pull down their hands. Kathleen, so it's got a loose eye. Mr. Keys, easy, and Lee are horrified. Mr. Keys, easy, when you have a minute, could you please clean that up? Easy, Romeo, sure. Turning to Lee, to continue, Lee nods. Easy, Romeo. So um, the fabric is thin and the stitching, one of the rhinoceros's legs falls to the floor. Everyone watches it drop. Easy, Romeo, oops. Lee pulls a lighter out of her pocket. Lee, let's see how flammable it is. Everyone except Lee, no. Pouting, Lee puts the lighter back in her pocket. Mr. Keys, easy. Please show the Kathleen the sales floor. Oh, don't bother. I'll just look around. Easy drops what's left of the rhinoceros on the floor next to the leg. Easy, Lee and Mr. Keys walk uh, back away from the rhino. Kathleen goes through the swinging door to the sales floor. Wanda Lee, what are you doing with a lighter? Lee jerks her thumb in Kathleen's direction. You can't be serious. In the background, as Lee and Mr. Keys talk, Easy approaches the choking hazard waste station. A reinforced metal bin, a full-length rubber apron, elbow-length rubber gloves, a face mask, goggles, a large broom, and a dustpan. Easy puts on the apron, gloves, goggles, and mask, and then goes to the, uh, the bin and opens three different layers of screen doors. He takes the broom and dustpan, warily approaches the rhino uh, detritus, then sweeps it into the dustpan. Mr. Keys. Just testing the waters. You need a partner with deep pockets. Her pockets may be deep, but everything else is rocky shallows. Lee picks up the errant eye. By the way, Romeo, that was a good analysis. She drops the eye into the dustpan. Uh, cut short by premature disintegration. As Mr. Keys and Lee talk, Easy walks uh, to the choking hazard bin and dumps the rhino parts. He closes and latches all three lids in succession, then takes off and hangs up the hazardous waste accessories. I asked about that lighter. Have it. You better not be smoking. I am not smoking, and I am not taking on a partner. Lee turns toward the office, tugging on her light earlobe. You can't ignore this forever, and you are going to pull that right ear off. That ear right off. That would be preferable to dying from nicotine withdrawal. No one dies from not smoking. Lee walks into her office. Thank you, Brian. Very, very well done. And Catherine, thank you for the script as well. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, so let's uh, let's take that apart. There's a there's a couple of themes that uh, that I see going on. Again, this is just the first ten pages uh, that we're taking a look at, uh, and we're going to go through the same process. So in the end, uh, I'm going to ask for suggestions on what the theme might be. So first of all, I wanted to share with you what I think the um, the secondary theme might be. And let me put that up right about with that button and that button and share. So there seems to be uh, some sort of precision that's going on and a very, uh, things are called out throughout the script, exact times, Y2K, which is the opposite of precision. If anyone lived through that, that was supposed to be a disaster. They meet before going to the store. Those are the collectors. 7.30 is called out in the subject line. Uh, a calendar reading Tuesday and nothing else hanging on the wall. We're talking about data. Expertise performs calculated, uh, with great expertise performs calculated tricks uh, with the yo-yo. Never get tangled in each other's strings. Again, it's precision, efficiency, organizing the, the toys by species. They're simply precision laced in lots and lots and lots of different uh, dialogue and scene descriptions. They do a critique. Eyes pop off, which is the opposite of precision. Uh, leg falls off, opposite of precision. They have a choking hazard station. They're uh, talk about good analysis. Uh, choking hazard, et cetera, et cetera. So a secondary theme that I see in this is, is simply the precision that is laced into this world. But what I wanna take a deeper dive into 
is the uh, what I would think is the the primary theme or the character theme of this. And let me share that with you. That is Lee's needs. Lee, um, her exterior need is uh, the store's health, health from the competition, staying ahead of it, and then also her health. So her health and the store's health might end up being uh, intertwined some, somehow. Uh, the interior need is not to compromise her values. So the theme at a topic level, I would say something like survival. And uh, where the theme lies is somewhere between uh, the store's health from the competition and, and being healthy, and then her, her need to not compromise her values. There's, a, there's an old prayer uh, that I thought of when I was looking at this. Oh, Lord, let me be pure, but not yet. So I think this theme might be something, uh, well, well, we'll get to the theme. I want to show you different examples of, of how her interior need and exterior need are, are called out here. It's a tough racket. It's not, it's not a calling. It's, it's a tough racket. Y2K, again, that's, that, that could be a, a big thing coming up for them. Uh, she's trying to do the right thing by giving uh, the waiter, uh, you know, she's trying to, this is a representative of Lee's values. The collectors, they are customers, big influential customers for them. Uh, Wallace ends up selling the toy to Anna Mae, which must be crushing. And how do the collectors know which store just got a shipment? Uh, this is a threat. She has to figure this out. Uh, the shipment of uh, uh, the, the shipment is short, so that threatens the, the uh, livelihood of the store. Mr. Keyes points out reality has a nasty habit of it's inserting itself, again, a threat to the store. Uh, they turn and look at the box because it's a little critter's line. Kathleen, uh, she is uh, again uh, fixing or might be a part of the future. So that, that's a threat because her attitude is to go with cheaper things, toys with button eyes. We, again, this is all, all theme that's laced into this, the, the, uh, the, the cheap, cheap uh, toys are called out again. Uh, what are you doing with a the lighter? Then Mr. Keys gets into uh, you know the idea of of, of uh, having having a lighter, and you better not be smoking. And this is this is where I'm starting to see her health uh, showing up. And th this is a nice exchange because it's thematic tension. Just testing the waters. You need a partner with deep pockets. Her pockets may be deep, but everything else is rocky shallows. So it's it's. The thematic conflict, whenever you can get this into an exchange of a couple people, if you get this into scenes, it just becomes infinitely a better scene because you have a different type of tension that's going to continue throughout the entire uh, uh, story. That is, if you're, you know, you're writing it to theme. So with that, let me uh, pull up a couple of themes that I came up with after reading this. Uh, why succeeding in, in business isn't worth losing your soul. She might, she's, Lee right now is in, a, in, in the anti-theme. She isn't ready to compromise, but her, her business is on the line. Uh, another idea is uh, there's a toll that must be paid for every compromise of conscience. So you can see how you take that and lace that into a bunch of these scenes that would be uh, continuing forward and have thematic tension uh, throughout the rest of the story. So what are, what are some other ideas that you guys might have as a good theme for survival, surviving as a topic? Anybody has anything? Just raise your hands, I'll unmute you. Tiffany, is that? I have a quick question from okay. the writer. Oh, a quick question of the writer, or is that? Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, wondering. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Okie dokie. A uh, couple questions. Does this take place before Y2K? It's 1999. Okay. 
And do they go into the year 2000 or do you leave that up in the air? Uh, it, it, it ends before the actual new year. Okay. Um, maybe it could be uh, insecure. One of the themes, one of the topics could be insecurity and identity. Does she identify herself as part of this, as part of, as, as the issues as business? Kind of like no reservations where uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones character says, this is my kitchen. And it was Aaron Eckhart's character. I can't remember the names of the story. Um, no, this is part of who you are. So maybe it's about her dealing with a potential loss and finding out who she is despite that loss. Um, she's, she, are you asking me? <laughs> uh, I'm not really asking you anymore. I got okay. the question. Okay. I am old enough to have owned a squirt. <laughs> So I see a couple of uh, suggestions in in the uh, uh, in the chat here. Uh, price versus value, good versus evil. Don't take yourself too seriously with toys and games. Again, uh, with a comedy, I don't think it, it has to be super complex. So simply writing from a topic, simply writing uh, from a, a really simple theme, uh, you can get all the way through it and maybe come up with something more complicated. Or like The Incredibles, you know, together we can do anything. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be super philosophical. Uh, and then more, more of these are coming through. Uh, you can't be, you, you can't precision your way to, into survival. Um, if there's something on partnership, if she's going, going to open up and let someone help, fantasy versus reality. All these are great. But no one wants to say them out loud. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Just, just keep typing them. Uh, toy, uh, toy business in life isn't, isn't fun in games. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the opening, opening statement. It's, it, it's a racket. So all of these are, are real good. Fantastic. Um, okay, so those were the two scripts I think uh, uh, I wanted to go through and wanted to show you. I mean, I could show you a couple examples of, of where this script could, you know, you could elevate it a little bit. How about if I do that uh, before we do any final questions? Because uh, I marked it up and get rid of that. And uh, share screen. And oh, it's way too far. Okay, so really a lot of these are uh, having to do with precision. So in the, the window booth, the condiment jars could be arranged short to tall. The waiter could have a pressed white uniform. Again, precision. Uh, perfectly centered, rather than just the television set mounted on the wall, it's perfectly centered on the wall. So again, there's just, once you have a theme, you can bump it up by, putting more of these, these words or descriptions into the, the scene description, the, uh, the characters themselves, the dialogue itself. It just helps. The more times people are exposed to it, the more evident it, it, it becomes to them. And action lines, of course, people aren't going to read, but if you put a prop, if you put you know, a location in there, it just, the more times you can put theme into, into your story, the more obvious it becomes. And so at the end, people feel it more. You have bigger, stronger endings. So is there any other questions that I can help with? Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send uh, the presentation uh, off to Kristen, uh, Kristen, and she will uh, distribute that. And that will uh, also have my my contact information in there as well. Uh, that is, I think, the next slide. Yep. So you can reach out and get a hold of me at any of those uh, those places. And I thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, thanks to everybody else for attending the class today. I really hope you had you. Um, I hope you found it helpful. 
Um, as, as Mike mentioned, um, I will be e emailing out the slides to you. Um, probably tomorrow we'll also, um, uh, we recorded this um, just in case there were a few people who were unable to make it today. So um, I will be sending that link um, in that email as well. So keep a, a lookout for that. Um, so our next class, as we've been we've been doing this once a, once a month now while we're all quarantining and everything. So our next class is going to be on September 20th. That will be tips for comedy writing. Um, there'll be more details of coming out about that soon. And I also have one more tease um, for next month. So watch our next newsletter, um, our September newsletter. There'll be another call for scripts. This will be to get your script read by professional actors at the Seattle Film Summit in November. So definitely start polishing your scripts now. And uh, thank you again, Mike, and everybody else. All right. All have right. a good night. Night.